Weird World Building is a series of videos wherein I needlessly overanalyze certain aspects of primarily world building in various anime and manga, going into what implications they may hold for that specific setting or story. Today we'll be tackling the tournament arc to end all tournament arcs, Record of Ragnarok. Let's begin. Number 1. Guided evolution is canon in the Ragnarok universe. Guided or theistic evolution is the view that evolution, while a natural process, was nonetheless consciously guided or set in motion on a preordained path by a personal and involved creator, i.e. more often than not, the Abrahamic God. It's a theistic view largely compatible with the findings of modern science pertaining to things such as the Big Bang, the age of the universe, the age of the Earth, the theory of evolution, and along with it, even natural selection. Now, a crucial theistic notion this view does allow for is the belief in the existence of souls, which is not only entirely compatible with, but is absolutely essential to the world building and setup of the Ragnarok universe, since all the human characters we see in Valhalla and other realms are, of course, manifest souls. A notable departure between Guided Evolution proper and its application in Ragnarok is that Guided Evolution proper always has the end goal of arguing for inherent human exceptionalism, which manifests in the form of a uniquely human moral worth and intuition, i.e. theistically the human soul. According to some holders of this view, namely Francis Collins, this is evidenced by the fact that the search for God is all but ubiquitous in human culture. However, as plainly evidenced by the presence of Lou Bu's trusty steed Red Hair, in Ragnarok, animals have souls as well. Also, Shiva suggests choosing another animal to evolve after humanity has been wiped out, meaning, of course, that other animals possess a capacity to be evolved to the level of humans. This would further provide evidence that at least all sentient beings possess a soul, rather than it being a unique or emergent property of humankind. Number 2. On the note of the Abrahamic God and the creation of man, how, if at all, does the capital G God fit inside the Ragnarok universe? God is directly referenced quite a few times throughout the manga, particularly during Adam's introduction and backstory, which should hardly be surprising. To add to this, Jesus is seen multiple times in the audience during Buddha's fight against Zero, unsurprisingly on the side of humanity. Now, we know that the gods, either a select few of them or on a collective level, evolved human kind over untold millennia. We also know that Adam was designated as the first ever human, i.e. it is with him that, as far as the gods were concerned, humanity as a species began. Adam was also said to have been made in the image of the gods. Gods as in plural, and in the image of some more than others apparently. This, as the first point about guided evolution established, this allows for the literal interpretation of the Bible, wherein a singular divine entity personally created Adam from dust. Could the capital G God of the Bible then be an analog for the collective will of all or at least the most powerful and involved gods, those that took it upon themselves to create and guide humanity. At least a few arrows actually point in that direction. It was stated that the gods actually voted to destroy the Tower of Babel, and one of Poseidon's moves is actually called the 40-day flood, implying that he, as the supreme ruler of the seas, may have been responsible for it. Like Babel, the 40-day flood was most likely another collective attempt by the gods to rebuke humanity with Poseidon being more than willing to be the executioner of the divine judgment. In this hypothetical canon of Record of Ragnarok, the Bible would actually be depicting the collective interactions of the gods with humankind, the mortal authors of which either misinterpreted or were deceived to the true nature of the capital G God. The gods mostly predate humans and are entirely independent of their worship, so they may have chosen to impart their collective wills in the form of a singular divine entity, as a kind of final attempt to get humanity to fall in line. While the theological elements would be unsalvageable, some of the general narrative and thematic elements of the New Testament and Jesus would remain largely the same. He could have been a wise teacher and prophet who was perhaps insightful enough to see where the world of man was headed, and thus encouraged humanity to follow him in the hope that the collective wills of the gods, i.e. the capital G God, may be appeased since that didn't work out, he instead put all the blame and punishment upon himself, thereby sparing humanity from yet another large-scale calamity. But 2,000 years and 45,000 Christian denominations later, and we got Ragnarok. 
at least he seems pretty cool with it. By the way, instead of being the embodiment of the collective will of the gods, I wanted to explore the possibility of the Abrahamic god being one of the primordial gods, but that didn't really make sense no matter how much I tried to make it fit. Uh, there's still some potential leeway with Beelzebub's curse and alter ego Satan being a primordial god, a fragment of one, or some kind of primordial entity, but there were no meaningful connections I could take anywhere. I'm leaving this in since I do think it is a cool concept, so if any of you can make it work, uh, please go right ahead. Number three, Eve's trial. So, the serpent, not Satan, attempts to uh, forcefully seduce Eve. She manages to escape with the help of her trusty animal companions, after which the serpent attempts to frame her, accusing her of having partaken of the forbidden fruit, of course. His evidence for this, apart from his own word, is an apple that's been bitten into. <laughs> the <laughs> I'm sorry, that's been bitten into. Now, let's completely ignore the fact that the gods have some primo advanced tech and that their forensics would have been centuries ahead at that time than what we have now. Instead, let's imagine that the gods had no access to any forensics whatsoever. Let's just imagine that all they had at their disposal are some basic critical thinking skills and their godly eyeballs. <laughs> Do I need to say it? Okay, some of you may only be listening. The apple has two very obvious jagged marks which are a perfect fit for the serpent's oversized fangs. The dude's not even trying to hide it. This got me completely off guard while I was reading it. It's seriously one of the few times a manga has made me laugh out loud. By the way, I know what the point of this was. It's not lost on me. The gods just wanted to punish Eve and didn't even really care about what the serpent's evidence was. He could have just done a uh, trust me bros and they would have been on board. The thing I don't get is why would the gods hate humans so much at this point in time? As in, it was after the trial that Adam and Eve left Eden to spend their time populating the rest of the Earth for the next 900 years or so, but they've presumably done nothing to incur the ire of the gods prior to the serpent's accusation of Eve. Like, I get the serpent, he's acting as a stand-in for the devil, but why would the rest of the gods be so unanimous in condemning the humans they've spent untold millennia evolving? Even then, they would have viewed humans as beneath them, sure, but... I mean, gods, or whatever entity the serpent was, probably some kind of demon, can lie. And the evidence is right there. Maybe the serpent packed the court with his sycophants, uh, promised everyone he'd reveal the truth about Zeus's nipples or something, I don't know. It was fun though, seeing proto-grandpappy giving the serpent his comeuppance. Moving on. Number four. Speaking of grandpappies, let's talk about the GFOC. The one and only grandfather of the gods, Zeus. First of all, the grandfather of the gods is the youngest among the four Olympian siblings. And second, why does he look so damn old? I get that the gods may be able to control their appearance to a degree, and that Zeus may have aged himself up a bit to really embody that GFOC aesthetic, but why does he also actually act old and decrepit even when not putting on a show? Gods are immortal and their appearance seems to be unchanging. It could be a consequence of him fighting and defeating Kronos, the titan of time, though I find it a bit difficult to imagine it wouldn't have been mentioned already if indeed true. Number five, Lu Bu was hanged by a rope. How? Even among the ranks of the superhumans battling the gods, I'd have to, and there's no greater insult to a Ragnarok enjoyer, question your tier list if Lu Bu's durability isn't at least average. With at least average durability among the Ragnarok participants, I fully expect Lubu to have the same experience getting executed as Gabimaru from Hell's Paradise or Kaido from One Piece, in that he'd find it more eventful to watch paint dry on a cold day. Like seriously, at least tie the guy up in chains, tie him down to a few boulders and toss him into the sea. I'd at least buy it that he'd drown, eventually. Number 6. Evoking the Laws of Inertia so, early on in Sasaki Kojiro's fight against Poseidon, the narrator tries to hype Kojiro up, explaining how, due to it being 1.5 times heavier than the average katana, which is by the way about 1 kilo or 2.2 pounds, halting the acceleration of Sasaki's sword was said to be nigh impossible, but that through sheer experience, determination and skill, he was able to do just that, creating a technique capable of cutting a swallow with turning speeds exceeding 200 kilometers per sec per hour. Hour? Oh wow, um, first of all, evoking any laws of physics in this series is a bold move, and second, I get it, it's the Tsubame Geishi, Geishi, 
Kaijin. The turning swallow cut. I get it, I do. It's just that coming off of the Adam vs Zeus fight with uh, Zeus's slowest punch clocking in at 0.01 seconds, I'm sure you'll find it understandable how unremarkable Kojiro suddenly halting a 1.5 kilo sword mid-swing sounds. Number 7. Jack the Ripper. I hate Jack the Ripper. I want to make this clear from the get-go. This point will be the most subjective one by far, and I'll essentially be ranting about something that's been bothering me for... years. As I was saying, I hate Jack the Ripper. Not just this Jack the Ripper, mind you, pretty much any Jack the Ripper. And if you've seen enough anime over the years, you'll have seen your fair share of Jack the Frickin' Rippers. Since for whatever damned reason, the Japanese love Jack the Ripper. Alright, I'm gonna stop spamming his name. I usually find his inclusion annoying for three reasons. A. He's overused. B. Whenever he does appear, the Ripper-inspired character almost always either has the goofiest or most idiotic design imaginable and C, the IRL Jack is an overrated and sensationalized hack, pun intended. The guy killed five women, and even that's disputed. The only reason he was never caught and the police had their suspects even then is due to luck, an actual lack of forensics, unlike with Eve, and the fact that London at that time was a city place of scum and villainy. Hearing a woman scream was probably more common than hearing a rooster's call. I'm slightly exaggerating, but you get my point. I am not a true crime buff, but as serial killers go, apart from his brutality, Mentality, Jack is Bush League at best. Now, I do have to applaud Ragnarok. While I jive with some of its designs much more than I do with others, going with a classic, gentlemanly look for Jack was, counterintuitively perhaps, insanely refreshing for me. The one thing that did not hit its mark for me, apart from him being Jack the Ripper, was his physical prowess, specifically his durability. While his hit-and-run fighting style, paired with his favorite terrain of the London cityscape, and a very powerful volume allowing him to turn anything he touched into divine weapon, was enough for me to buy into him defeating a straightforward brawler like Hercules, him taking any direct hits from Herc and not getting obliterated seemed like quite the stretch in my eyes. While a world-class assassin, he was never portrayed as a martial arts master such as Sasaki or Quinn, or an aberrant physical specimen like Lu Bu or Raiden. Instead, Jack is a cunning master of assassinations, stealth and deception, a glass cannon rogue who most gods, especially those renowned for their pure physical prowess such as Herc, should be more than capable of one-shotting. Like seriously, Kirk was able to take down a god with a non-divine weapon even before the boost later provided to him by Herculean Exodus. In my eyes, this works to either scale up Jack, close to Blue Boo's levels of durability, or scale down Herc as one of the weakest hitters among the gods. While you don't have to agree, of course, I hope you can at least see where I'm coming from. These were the reasons why I found it so frustrating that among all the human participants, Jack was among those that actually managed to defeat their godly opponent. Number 8. How is Buddha even here? So I don't know a lot about Buddhism. Actually, no, let me rephrase that. Uh, I know very little about Buddhism. But my superficial understanding is that its core principles and teachings revolve around attaining enlightenment or nirvana by exiting the cycle of karmic reincarnation or samsara, with the Buddha being the first person to have done so. The issue here is that according to general Buddhist teachings, there are six realms of samsara. The hell realm, the hungry ghost realm, the animal realm, the demigod realm, the human realm and the god realm. Since Buddha was once a mortal man, and a preacher, it would seem that he somehow ascended to godhood. How his apotheosis occurred is never touched on, but from a Buddhist perspective, it seems that Buddha accumulated enough positive karma to ascend from the human realm to the god realm following his death. But that would mean that he was still a part of samsara, which doesn't really track with core Buddhist teachings, based on what I understand. The Buddhists in the crowd should be far more taken aback at seeing their transcended and transcendental teachings teacher in the first place. Though on the topic of dental, since you can still apparently get cavities as a god, Valhalla and its adjacent realms may not be the god realm as described in Buddhist teachings after all, since devas or gods are supposed to be able to enjoy all the pleasures of the world without needing to do any of the work or incurring any of the consequences. The repeated referencing to Buddha getting cavities could also simply be a running gag that I'm unnecessarily overthinking. 
Number 9. If I'm not overthinking it though and gods can get cavities, this means there are godly bacteria. Cavities are caused by bacterial activity and if they can affect the divine denticles of deities, imagine what they could do to humans. You wanna wipe humanity out? Have a god sneeze. And finally, number 10. Magic. Record of Ragnarok has a strange relationship with magic. It's perhaps one of the most original things about its world building. See, magic is very rarely brought up, and when it is, it's brought up almost derisively. Tesla is referred to as human history's one and only sorcerer, due to the sheer level of his scientific advancements. This title is, of course, supposed to evoke Arthur C. Clarke's quote that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Furthermore, in Tesla's fight against Beelzebub, when the Lord of Flies uses his ability, Tesla claims it's not magic, but science, explaining that what Beelzebub uses is the power of vibration to create his various seemingly magical, offensive and defensive attacks. For the one who echo and watching this, uh, you know who you are. This is like Battler trying to prove a closed room murder wasn't done by magic, while viewing the crime scene, which by the way often includes himself, from a pocket dimension surrounded by witches and demons. Sure, the vibrations themselves may abide by the laws of physics, but how is he creating and controlling them in the first place, if not by what most would consider magic? Quite a few gods we've seen have showcased innate abilities they've weaponized in their battles. Beelzebub can vibrate his body at high frequencies, Hades can imbue divine weapons with his blood to empower them, Buddha can see into the future by reading an opponent's soul, and so on. These entirely preternatural abilities aren't actually considered magical, but are simply an innate and essential part of a god's divine being. This is a world where gods, valkyries, demons, souls, and other supernatural entities exist as an innate part part of the wider cosmos. As such, none of them can be said to go against the laws of nature, and thus, in the strictest sense of the word, be supernatural. In a similar sense, humans can also be born with or develop superhuman abilities or skills, such as Adam's divine reflection, Sasaki's ability as the ultimate scanner, Quincy's keysight and manipulation, and so on. None of these abilities are considered magical per se, since they are a natural part of a deity's being, in the case of gods, or an overdeveloped skill or morphological feature in case of humans. The only human so far that can be stated to be imbued with a full-on divine power would be Adam, and I don't think I need to explain why that is. While a very much refreshing take on world-building gods, their powers and domains, this sort of setup does risk one very major thing, becoming repetitive and in the worst case, boring. While I overall like the Queen Shi vs Hades fight, the one thing that definitely didn't hit its mark for me was Hades' fighting style. It felt, I'm sure purposefully to emphasize their brotherly bond, as an echo of Poseidon's own. There's only so many ways you can draw someone wielding a tri or bident while calling those moves something different. Ragnarok has been pretty good about giving its competitors varying fighting styles, weapons and gimmicks, but I can't help but feel slightly disappointed at the powers or complete lack thereof displayed by some of the particular particularly godly competitors. So, remember how I said that number 7, covering my unbridled hatred for Jack the Ripper, was the most subjective point? Well, this is the most objective one. Here you can feast your eyes on the objectively correct Record of Ragnarok power tier list. If your list doesn't match mine, please do be sure to change it to at least more closely resemble it. Unless you don't care about being both correct and right, of course. Which is fine. Live and let live. As always, thank you very much for watching. If you have any weird world building recommendations please do voice them in the comments the research and scripting for them takes a while to do so i'd like to start working on the next one relatively soon if you'd like to go the extra mile in supporting the channel do consider becoming a channel member and i'll see you in the next one